Okay, as they get set up, I would like to welcome everybody to LMU. We are happy to have Swami Ma Radha Bharati here as our first Wednesday night lecture of this semester. Um, we have been having a wonderful week of workshops with her. If you're interested, there's one more day that you can attend tomorrow morning. We'll have a workshop here in the one in the room is 1859. It's um, on this side of the building below us. And the classes will be from 9 to 1130. We have been having really experiential classes with her. She lectures some and then going deep into meditation, relaxation um, in the Himalayan yoga tradition. Um, and we have been so thankful that she's been sharing all of this wisdom and this experiential practice with us. So thank you for being here. And um, tonight she's going to speak about living purposefully, dying gracefully. We have a few other events coming up. On Saturday we have a open house, a graduate open house. If you're interested in learning more about our yoga studies, our Masters of Yoga Studies program, please come and join us. It will be here in the University Hall from 10 a.m. till 2 p.m. At 11, we have our information session, particularly for our um, program. Um, you can find more information. Do we have that particularly online? Or if you're part of our, um, if you're part of our news, if you get our newsletter or part of our mailing list, if you're not, you should have received it. If you're not a part of it, then you can, mm -hmm. Connect with Amy. Give me your emails before you leave if you haven't already. And there's a Facebook event. Um, so follow our Facebook page and then we post the event on there. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Um, but we send it all out. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, so if you'd like to learn more about our program, we'll have that on Saturday. And then the following Saturday, October 26th, we have our yoga day. Oh so all day long we'll have yoga day uh, starting at 10 a.m. till 7.30 p.m. at night. We have a lot of experiential classes. We're really focusing on accessible yoga for everybody this year. Um, we really look forward to having you come and share your time with us. You can take one class, stay the whole day. Uh, we'll have some kirtan in the evening, and that will be wonderful. We're going to have more classes, uh, I mean more Wednesday evening lectures, just like this, um, well, not just like this one, but more Wednesday evening lectures. Um, there will be one in November, so just visit our website, LMU Yoga Studies. Uh, please visit us there, and you can learn more about all of the events that we have going on. Okay, all right. So I would like to welcome, officially, <laughs> Swami Ma Radha Bharati. I'm going to read her bio, so you guys maybe have already read this. Um, but she's a disciple of Swami Rama and Swami Veda and the, Him and the Himalayan yoga tradition since 1970. Since then, she has studied, practiced, and taught the principles of the Himalayan tradition throughout the world. She has served as founding counsel and director of the Gurukulam at Swami Rama Sadaka Grama and frequently guides the participants of silence and sadhana retreats. She holds an MA and has done PhD work in comparative philosophy and ethics. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So, can you hear me? Is it right? Mm -hmm. It's on. It's on? Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me. When I uh, uh, agreed to come, or was invited to come, I should put it that way, I never dreamed I'd find such a welcoming uh, meditative group. I thought maybe people just kind of curious, but so many of you are practitioners and serious practitioners, and it's just really, really beautiful. I hope that I can stay in touch with many of you even after I leave and stay in touch. Um, tonight's talk is, um, as uh, Dr. Narendran said, that uh, it will be on teachings of the sages, uh, living purposefully, dying gracefully. And uh, the first part I'm just going to develop, it's kind of straightforward. And then uh, 
there are some things that I'll just go over quite lightly, leaving it open for discussion later. So, um, and I really will look forward to the discussion and because um, there'll be uh, uh, a lot of places to discuss, depending on your interest. Um, and I'm going to be referring to my notes quite a bit. I apologize for that, but uh, it's the way um, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so living purposefully suggests that you have some purpose, some goal, something you're working toward. And for most of you being here at the university, I presume you're purpose, main purpose now is pursuing your education and, um, and after you've finished your education, your purpose will be getting a job, getting established, perhaps moving, or if you don't already have a home, finding a home and a car to get to work and clothes to suit your job. And these are all to fulfill our basic needs of um, food, sleep, sex, self-preservation. These are the four fundamental needs that we have that we don't have a lot of choice. We have to work and we have to provide for ourselves to satisfy these basic needs or urges. But these <coughs> urges, these same, we call them the four fountains, <laughs> um, are the same as animals have. Animals have need for food, sleep, sex, self-preservation. <clears throat> and nature controls their this needs, these needs in, in them so and they don't have choices about as much as we do anyway to how to fulfill them so our needs get very complicated and mixed in with a lot of desires and emotions and our um, our needs we don't need just a house we need a certain kind of house and we don't need certain you know just a car, we need a certain kind of car to really fulfill our need and our identity and our, our uh, needs keep growing and developing and getting more elaborate usually. Um, and then it seems like whenever we get things set up just right, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know where this is going to go. <laughs> Things change, and you know the disappointment and frustration. And you start out again, and uh, you know you find uh, maybe a partner, and uh, everything's wonderful, it's great, and then the partner doesn't live up to your expectations, or there's illness, or there's some big change, and even things like that don't go as we might have envisioned and um, get a house and then the maintenance or the upkeep or your ideas about how it should be expanded and changed and you find yourself not able to sustain it and you, that might change. This, these kinds of things go on and on and on in, in all these areas. And we just get frustrated, you know, especially if, um, you know, in the, at the times of a, like a trauma uh, or just the routine of the rat race and the doing and the change, all the changes, things always change. It's the whole nature of things, they change. And, um, and when we just think there must be something more to life than this. This doing again, doing again, change, doing again, doing again, the daily rat race, we call it. Or there's some 
tragedy or some uh, thing that just really is, makes a huge impact on you. And at those times, we get even a little more reflective on just, you know, why am I here? What am I doing? Even who am I? Because when there is a big loss of some kind or serious illness, who we thought we were, it's, things change. We identify with, with the way things are. And we just um, are really, uh, th these are the four basic questions that people have asked time since the beginning of human life, you know, who am I, where am I going, why am I here? Um, and Swami Rama says that we need a personal philosophy of life to give us some direction about these big questions. And not a, a big metaphysical theory with proofs and everything, but some inkling about what life is about, where, what, who am I? Some, some idea. And we probably do have some philosophy of life. And maybe when we come to a time of trauma, it clarifies a little bit more. You hear of people undergoing some serious trauma, and they, you know, they, they feel like they're just beginning their life from that point. It really gives them a direction. And to help, you know, to give an example of what brief little idea of of different kinds of philosophies of life. Like, what about eat, drink, and marry, or tomorrow you may die? That would be a philosophy of life. Or money buys happiness. Or it doesn't matter what you think, it's determined. You're just kind of like a puppet. Everything's already fixed. Or the idea that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You really have to scrap and scrape against everybody else to get anything. You can see how the different trajectories with just those kinds of philosophies, how different life would be. And so the, the feeling that there might be more to life than the rat race, I think that probably all of you here have given more thought to this than the average person. And the sages and saints of, over time have offered answers to these questions and guidelines. And one thing that, in whatever tradition, and however it's said, they say, know thyself. And in uh, the tradition that I come from, the Himalayan tradition, the purpose of life is a spiritual purpose. It's life is an opportunity to grow spiritually and to become a better human being. And ultimately, self-knowledge or self-realization or enlightenment is the the highest goal. And um, uh, it offers guidelines for attaining that. Um, now here's where I'm starting to, to look <laughs> at my notes. I really apologize for this. Um, OK. so. That gives some direction. Uh, knowing thyself, there's something more to life than this rat race. 
that means that the goal is inward. And we, we're not finding it out here, the answers. Are we, or they're, they change. We think we've got the answer, then they change and drop away. So what we're looking for is something permanent, some permanent happiness, and to know the direction to that. And it's an inward direction, because obviously it's not out here. And, OK, know thyself. That self is not the personality. It's like not self with a small s. It's the self with a big s. That's beyond mind, beyond personality, beyond body, beyond the highest thing in your mind. To some permanent happiness, to some um, something that won't change. And we're told that that, that, that our true nature, our true essence, is ever wise, ever pure, ever free. It's already in that state. But if that's our self, our true essence, ever wise, ever pure, ever free. How come we don't know it? How come we're struggling so? And it's probably because we're not looking in the right direction. We're living out here. And we have to do that. We have to take care of ourselves. But that we're, that we're so directed this way outward in all of our goals, all of our degrees, all of our plans. Uh, our, we see our future out here. And we're not paying so much attention, attention inwardly. Even if we have a meditation practice and uh, are, you know, have changed our lives to facilitate that, we're still so directed outward that it's just um, most of our purpose of life is still out there. And in, you know, in, in today's world, <laughs> everything, I bet you all have a cell phone in your pocket or in your hand at the moment even. That there's just so many screens, so many things that we really keep us out here. We eat with our phones, and I know people who go to bed with their phones, and you know, it's, you just can't leave home without it. And we are so dependent on it. But but it's this technology is solving some problems, but it's really getting us stuck outward. So what do we do to turn things around? Well, I've mentioned the saints and sages um, offer guidelines and enlightened beings uh, uh, talk about it, have written about it since centuries. And that wisdom, that when it's the real wisdom from their paths of, to enlightenment and happiness, then that lasts through the ages. It doesn't have to be some modern writer or some modern teacher. It's that ancient wisdom and even those enlightened persons who are more contemporary. That's a, that's a lasting thing. And I'm, I'm not talking about self-help books and self-help teachers. Oh, they just abound everywhere. <laughs> There's the hugest section in the bookstore. 
<laughs> and oh, you see posters everywhere, you know, how to get your life under control and these kinds of things. And they have part of the picture. There's good information out there. But for the most part, it's not going to get you where you really want to go if you want permanent happiness and self-knowledge. And if, if you really want to make the highest goal your goal of life, you have to look deeper than the self-help books. And so, I think many of you have uh, aligned yourself to maybe certain teachings or teachers uh, kind of followed your inclination. And if you haven't, it's good to then read or study the teachings of enlightened beings and find teachings of the life of some sage or some path. Like I'm, uh, on a, I'm in the Himalayan tradition. Uh, that is a tradition that, you know, I can say I'm recommending looking for a path or teachings. And I have to say that they kind of came to me. <laughs> I was, I, I didn't grow up where people searched for teachers. That was a, a concept I didn't have. I know some of my contemporaries, uh, not from my small hometown, uh, went looking for teachers, traveled around the world, and listened. And I was just frustrated. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know there was such a possibility. And a friend I worked with invited me to a meditation class with uh, Swami Veda Bharati. He's a disciple also of Swami Rama. And he um, ended up uh, being an enlightened being himself. And, uh, it, and even uh, that first class, he wasn't even Swami Veda yet. He was Usher Buddha Arya teaching Sanskrit in the South Asian studies at the University of Minnesota. And he started teaching. Uh, Swami Rama told him he should begin teaching. And um, I, it just like I was hearing things about how to live and, and practice meditation that I just never even dreamed was out there. I had no idea. I was so inspired. And the meditation felt like putting on an old shoe. You know, it just fit. And uh, I was just so fortunate. <laughs> uh, uh, at, at the end of my frustration, without searching, going here and there, uh, and, and I, that was in 1970, and I've been there ever since uh, on that path. But it, it really made a direction for me and practices. It, it just, I can't tell you, I can't imagine the uh, harried, frustrated individual I'd be without that. Uh, and, uh, and of course, it takes time, but a lot of years. <laughs> I'm always embarrassed to say 1970, because I think people must think, I grief she should be enlightened by now all those years. <laughs> but uh, it takes <laughs> lifetimes and time, yeah. But if you, you know, ex cry out a path or a teaching or the teachings of a particular sage or saint, um, it 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 will at least until you you know provide some direction uh, until it doesn't you know then if it doesn't take you where you want to go and you try another path uh, but maybe that's not the way for you maybe it has already fallen in your lap or your parents they have. Uh, in practitioners, and, and it's just been easy 
because there it is for you. Um, and a, a saying Swami Rama would say, but I've read it in Buddhist uh, books also, to get where you want to go, to the place you want to go, you have to leave where you are now. So if it's not working for you, then it's up to you to take a step and do something about it. Otherwise, you'll be in the place <laughs> where you are now. And so then, um, setting yourself on a path, or just even if you don't find one that you have an affinity, to just um, to the best you can on your own without the teachings. But here you are. I mean, you're in a wonderful place. You've chosen to be here in this department, or these you know, departments of here in theology and yoga and South Asian studies and so on. That you're, you're hearing, you're, you're being exposed constantly to the different teachings. And, and, uh, and uh, when you did choose, or when you will choose a path, maybe try a few experimentally. But you know, to use a metaphor like uh, using, you know, rerouting your path, using a GPS to kind of reroute, uh, and uh, and then to to take that route, and. Um, And uh, when you choose, you're on a route, <clears throat> then if there are obstacles in the road, <laughs> you need to, to remove some of those. Or even, excuse me, I've had issues with my throat, and <clears throat> so I have hot water here. To take a route, <clears throat> there are some more exterior obstacles that uh, maybe need to be cleared away even to reroute yourself. And those are uh, like maybe your lifestyle is still eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> and you're wanting to go inward. So it's the rerouting is taking that into consideration. Or maybe uh, you have uh, relationships, many relationships of people who are living a very different lifestyle. And maybe it's kind of rethinking some of those relationships or the amount of time um, that you spend. Or if you find yourself at odds with your culture or your family, maybe taking some steps to do what you can to just make those areas of your life smoother. That's part of rerouting. And to accept responsibility. Now again, using the kind of this car or <laughs> driving analogy to accept uh, responsibility for the the previous fines or wrong directions or um, wrong turns. Collisions. <laughs> Collisions, <laughs> yes. That, um, that still have repercussions. And, you know, um, some karmic things going on. What's, those fines have to be paid. 
but you can, with your routing, then take the right turns and you know use you know so that you don't accumulate more repercussions from your actions, choosing more wisely, and so that uh, you burn the karma in a way that keeps you going on the route. And then do care and maintenance. <laughs> I was having fun with this. <laughs> <laughs> to fulfill your duties. We all have a lot of duties in life. That, you know, because we never have time. You know, we think, oh, I want to be on this path, but I don't have time. So we assess our duties. You know, we, have a, we all have a duty to ourselves to take care of ourselves. But if you have family, you have some duties. And kind of by default, we have some duties to parents um, and jobs, volunteer things, or clubs, committees, uh, just so many areas. If you list your duties, it's sometimes kind of overwhelming. <laughs> But to figure out how you, know, you continue with the ones that are most helpful or that are part of your path. Um, when I um, first moved to India, um, I ended, you know, I had been doing a lot of volunteer work in the community and so on. And I just, you know, I felt like I had been there and I had done that, and the way was opening to do something else with my life. And so there was just kind of a natural ending for some of those duties that were fulfilling, but now they weren't going to fit so well on my path. And of course, you have your mortgage and your rents and car payments and all of that that are duties. We have so many duties. And then to use a guidebook and follow the directions for your inner journey. Because it's a, if you really want to uh, find permanent happiness, you're going to have to look <coughs> inward. Because everything out here changes. There's just no getting around it. It, it changes. And so we find happiness, but it doesn't last. It's temporary. So to find the per permanent happiness and the sense of fulfillment, you know, we think, ah, oh, if I just get that degree, then ah, oh, I'll sit back. And, but then we still don't feel quite fulfilled. <laughs> and so going inward is going to be the directions. Now, every philosophy, and at least I tend to think every time I, my, to my awareness, every spiritual philosophy has a set of practices that go with it to attain the goal or some instruction for attaining the goal along with the this goal that the philosophy sets out. And so uh, part of the deal is to you know, not only clear out some of the obstacles and the obvious things to get your, your life rerouted, but to, um, to do the practice. Like in my tradition, meditation is the main practice. But there are other practices. In order to be able to sit down and meditate, you have to do the other practices to quiet your body, your mind, and, and to, do, to sit for meditation. So uh, there's a whole bunch of practices to, to do. And one of the 
big obstacles uh, to following those instructions. You know, you always hear the, the spirit's willing, but the body's weak. <laughs> and um, it's a lot of our emotions and, and attachments and things that make it difficult to follow a path and, and to do the practices and to really stay focused. And I remember when I first started like really hearing, you know, they're talking about emotions and emotional purifications. And, and I thought, well, my emotions aren't a problem. <laughs> I mean, I was so blind to my emotions that I, I didn't think I had any problems, you know. Um, so that it's really hard to see what's standing in the way of really going forward. I practiced, but I had, there were, you know, we all have deep some scars and issues and traumas that are there deep inside of us that uh, pop their heads up in ways that interfere with our turning inward, because when we turn inward, those things are there. When we're so busy outward, they don't present themselves. And so we can just sort of pretend we don't have them. And so that was, um, that was a, a surprise for me. And it's, and it's not easy to recognize those kinds of obstacles and how they're interwoven with our desires and our attachments and our identities. So that's, um, that's something that we have to start paying attention to. And that, to remove those deeper obstacles is a big part of the work in the inward journey. And it takes a long time for us to even know that we have for what it is that's causing the issues. We're just reacting to it. But we, we, are, we don't know where that's coming from because we don't know even our small self <laughs> with a small s, much less the, the true essence with a big s. And the philosophy of the Himalayan tradition goes on then to teach that everything that happens in your life is an opportunity to transform yourself and your life. Stuff's happening all the time. <laughs> Not just big things that stick out. All of life is an opportunity to be working on changing and transforming. It's not a, it's a transformation. Because it's still going to be your personality and your bag of karma and your habits and emotions going forward. So it's transforming that and transforming your life to see each thing that comes at you as an opportunity. Well, this is a challenge. It must be something in me that, you know, um, that needs work. And if you don't notice it, the universe is really good at really slamming it in your face <laughs> just so that you see it. And yes, we've had those experiences that if we're not getting it, things happen over and over, and then all of a sudden, pow, you know. Uh, there it is. We can't ignore it anymore. And so, so the very situations that cause stress and our fears are the very things that will help us to transform. You know, um, I'm thinking of, you know, welcoming these things in. There's a roomy, roomy poem that you're maybe familiar with, The Guest House. Mm -hmm. A lot of you have heard of that. 
I just came across that quite recently. And I just love that, that it's to, you know, all these things, these situations and unexpected difficulties and or wonderful things that happen um, unexpectedly. To, to, they come into your life, and so you just welcome them all in. Oh, here you are. You know, it can be a terrible thing. Here you are. Come on in. You've come to help me transform myself and give them the best place in the house. You know, to, and I've, I've worked with that. One of my friends wrote and said, do you have a lot of guests in your guest house today? <laughs> You know, it's quite full most of the time. <laughs> but I love that way of looking at things because it's it really kind of lightens it, you know, like, oh no, you know, you answer the door and there it is. Uh, with a lot of baggage. <laughs> so and then also to realize that the stress you experience is in you. The anger that you experience is in you. We tend to think that person is the cause of my anger, or this situation made me so angry. Well, it might not make another person so angry, but it makes you angry. The anger is in you. And this is um, something we have to observe and accept and, and learn from it, then that's information that you didn't have before. Oh, all these realizations are like, wow, I didn't know that about myself. It was really crummy of me, you know. But you don't see it until you see it. And until you see it, you can't transform it or change it or do anything about it. Um, And then to realize that we have choices and that we have the capacity, we all have all that we need to follow through on choosing to change how we react. Because, like oh, I said this in class the other day, um, Swami Veda would remind us that almost everything we do is not an action. It's a reaction. We're constantly reacting. And then when we react, we're just kind of bypassing our choices in thinking. We just, like, we're doing it. You watch. You just see uh, how how you don't really, you know, you probably all, I think I mentioned this kind of example in class, if you're in a relationship, uh, one person says something and the other one says the other, you could predict, you could just write the script, the same kind of reaction and action, the same, you have the same dialogue going on between you and your spouse or partner, um, or things that you do at work, sure enough, every day, you're, it's going to come up, uh, and you react. It makes you so angry every day. I'm so tired of this. It's always like this, you know. That was yesterday. That was yesterday. <laughs> okay. no, <not> yesterday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least it's not every day. <laughs> it didn't happen today. Okay. So, to remember, we have ch uh, choices. Um, and uh, that our attitude, or just how we uh, manage the, these obstacles, a lot of it is an attitude change, like this welcoming everybody into the guest house. That's a wonderful attitude change to, to make. Uh, but to accept the responsibility that how you're responding or your own emotions is something in you that is part of the problem. 
and, and that's a big one to look at. If you're having a difficulty with a person, then what part is in you? It's not all in the other person. So if you own the part that's in you, what's your contribution to the conflict? That's where you can start making changes the most, because you can't change other people. So owning your part of the problems and the situations is really important. And even the things that we really suffer under. And uh, this is Thich Nhat Hanh says, people have a hard time letting go of their suffering out of fear of the unknown. They prefer su suffering that is familiar. And I think we can all relate to that. You just keep hitting your head against the wall because that's what you know what that can feel like. <laughs> and so we do that. Or you might, you know, like identify as being the the victim, and um, that's comfortable. And so you kind of just stay in that and make feeble attempts at at it. Um, I remember a time in my life where I was divorced, and I had a little child, and I had a job, and I was going to school, and I had huge financial problems <laughs> trying to pay the rent and tuition and child care, and, and it was, um, and uh, it just seemed like for a while, a chunk of years, everything would, that could go wrong seemed to keep going wrong. I remember <laughs> my sister, when I would talk to her on the phone, she said, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm afraid to call you because there's always something new that's so awful in your life. And, and it just, I, you know, I just, you know, like, oh, you know, th th all this was happening to me. Um, and it took some time uh, for that to turn around. And I had to make some changes. And it was only in retrospect, because it seemed like just awful years of my life. It was in retrospect that I realized that was a very spiritually rich time of my life. In fact, that thought was reinforced. I, in India, we sometimes go to this Vedic astrologer. I've gone a few times, two, three times. And he, was, he said, this time, this period from this year to this year, really spiritually rich. And I thought, that's when it was the worst, you know. But I hung in there. That was the only thing that I could really rely on in myself. And that time is my daily practice, my meditation practice. And it, it was a lot of time interrupted with the fear of, you know, how am I going to get through this, but that's where I must have been making the deep transformations, and then gradually it manifested at a more external level, and, and I got through. And so even when things seem the worst, that like somehow uh, it's, it's just not going right at all. If you persist and try to keep one toe on the path at least, that can be very transformational time, a very important time. Because you keep yourself going forward. You have your uh, purpose that is just that I'm, I'm going to make some changes, or that I, you know, I'm going to at least do this practice, and maybe not even thinking of the big philosophy at the time, but you know that that's helping you. And, and so you just keep at it, and uh, it, it prevails. And those, yeah, and those pains, 
sometimes it, things get so bad that you have to do something different. I always say that that uh, that's part of it. When it just seems like, okay, this totally isn't working. I got to do something else, even on a more gross level, not just your your practice and on a more subtle transformation. But you just have to. It's more uncomfortable to keep suffering than it is to make a change. And those, I'm sure you all have had times like that where it just seems like, okay, it's inevitable. I've got to step out of my comfort zone here and do something else. And, and that's, that's a, a growing step also. Mm -hmm. We have about 10 minutes left. Would you like oh, to take my. some questions? Goodness sakes, I'm building up so long that it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's a wealth. Thank well, you. Well, let me just jump I'm, um, closer to the end. Um, I was thinking I'd do that a lot faster. I'm sorry, I'm usually good at keeping track of time, but I'm not tonight. Um, Okay, so um, one of the, I'll mention and I'll just try to touch quite briefly on this and then I come um, more to the end, that one of the things that uh, really keeps us turned outward is our attachments to the objects of the world. Um, and of course, we have a lot of attachments, um, and there are things to take care of in the world, and it's just really uh, uh, hard to, um, to, to let go of things. Um, attachment means we believe we need some object for our existence. And this is the ego operating in um, this example. This car is mine. This car means I am successful. This car helps identify me. Uh, or I need this relationship. Without this person, I cannot be happy. If that person leaves, then life will be meaningless. And that is meaningless because my part of my identity is being with that person. So it makes it a real loss if that person leaves or passes away. Or if you identify with your job or attached to the job. And, and so then if the job changes, it's like your very self changes. It's a life and death matter, it feels like. And to somebody else watching, they think, well, just let the job change. But if you're really identified with it, it's, it's, it's like a death. <coughs> and um, all of us are probably attached to our bodies and identified with our bodies. If your body is beautiful, then that makes you a beautiful person. Or if your body is um, sick, then I am sick. It's not like the body's sick. And, um, and if you identify with the body, then the thought of the body getting older and slowing down is scary. Even changes in eyesight and, and capacity, that's all scary because that's your, that's you, that's your existence. And so death, the idea of death is, is really frightening. Because if you identify with the body and you know you've seen other people die, but we think that that's not going to happen to us. <laughs> but um, so uh, we start reacting in fear when we identify with the body. And any change in the body is really frightening. I'll just kind of uh, 
I'll go forward uh, saying Lao Tzu, you know, Lao Tzu, the Chinese philosopher. When I let go of what I am, I become what I might be. I think that's just a really beautiful, kind of a deep quote. But the problem with these attachments and identities is that they're so woven into our emotions and desires and everything that we don't even recognize when we're attached to things or identifying with them. It's a really tough one. And it's, and people might, you know, in my experience, I started realizing some of the attachments when, you know, after people started, you know, being critical of how I was doing things, saying I was being controlling. And I thought, no, this is just what I have to do. This is how the job has to be done, and this is how I'm doing it. And it was like, it really, I, I still don't really know how it was I identified, but obviously, because <laughs> I was trying to control the situation, I just like, you know, I had to hang on. Uh, because it seemed like that was absolutely necessary. It had to be that way. And it, you know, with a lot of, then uh, things, the universe kind of takes over. <laughs> and you realize something. I still don't know exactly how it was, because it was so interwoven. But I sure know that I changed, and I, my life changed. It was a big change. And, and so that's, so to recognize, to, to really watch for the signs and symptoms and where, you're, where the rub is and where you're getting criticism or, or, or uh, accusations of trying to control a situation. And you should look at that, how you're attached. It's only a couple paragraphs left, and I'm just like seeing the order of um, how it's uh, to present it. Um, well, okay, so let's get to the, the part of, about graceful, dying gracefully. Living, you can see living purposefully. I think I've made an elaborate point, and I had intended to leave the second part more brief to invite discussion. But the wisdom uh, in our tradition, um, you know, it's a good practice each day. You know, if you um, if you want to have a good day tomorrow, um, or if you want to have a beautiful last thought tonight, you live a, a beautiful day, have beautiful thoughts all day, and then your last thought at night will be a beautiful thought. So in order to have a beautiful last thought tonight, have a beautiful thought the whole day. Because the last thought of tonight is the gathered force, the sum total of the thoughts of today. Right? If that's true, if our thoughts continue from day to day, from sleep to the next wakefulness to the next sleep, it's just the kind of a continuum of the thought, the trajectory of our thinking from day to day to day. There's no abrupt change, depending you know, how our thoughts are going and how our lives are going on a day to day to day to day basis. 
So then, it is also true that death is not anything abrupt. It's not a break. The forces that have been gathered throughout the life over a long period of time will continue into the next life, like a next day, how you live today. Through the sleep, you wake up, it continues in the sleep, and then a whole lifetime of momentum, of habits, of values, of how we live from day to day will be there. It's not going to change at the end. You're not all of a sudden going to think some high philosophical thoughts. It's not going to change. It's going to be a continuation. This is why living purposefully is so important. Because then you have a habit and a continuum of going forward. And then that is there. That trajectory is there at the end of your life and into the next life. It is, puts you through. To the next life, the continuation. It's, it just died, so it must be at the <laughs> <laughs> So it's our values and how we live that are reflected at the time of death. It's the momentum of the content of this life that is there at the end and shapes our last moment and our next life. So attitude building is important. What we've been doing with our whole life, uh, that attitude. And you know, Ram Das, a few people who Ram Das, had this teacher, all an international teacher, yoga, and I don't so much yoga, but meditation and spirituality. And he had a stroke. And he said that uh, there he was lying in the emergency room on a gurney, looking up at the ceiling and being critical of the way they had run their heat ducts. <laughs> <laughs> and then when he reflected on that later, he was just appalled. He said, here I am, the big spiritual teacher going all over the world, and I'm at death's door, and I'm thinking of the heat ducts. <laughs> and so he really stepped up his own practice in his teachings, how he taught, and the urgency with which he told people they must live. You must not to wait, because you don't know, even if you're young and vital, uh, you don't know. And so what we do know, what we can do, is make it more predictable by how we live. And then for those of us who have mantras, the more we practice the mantra and use the mantra, the mantra is fills the mind so much in your life that when it will be there, that energy will be there through passing. And now I didn't leave time for your questions. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>